It's a great pleasure to be here, and I thank Dr. Crawford for inviting myself to be present in this meeting. My topic is on key references from ASCO SEP7, and it's co-authored by myself and Dr. David Einstein, who's a co-author with me on uh, the ASCO SEP chapter. What is ASCO SEP? It's a self-evaluation program directed at all medical oncology fellows, practitioners, and cancer health providers, nation and worldwide. It serves as the go-to reference for board examination preparation for medical oncology. And it's a volume that contains not only the scientific information on every disease category within the cancer realm, but global and disparity section for each of the ma major cancer disciplines. It contains well-crafted questions for physicians to self-assess their skills. And it emphasizes the inclusion of practice-changing articles in the original chapter in a update, which is done every six months, which is reviewed by the editorial ASCO staff, as well as five outside international reviewers. And so some of the features of ASCO SEP, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, access uh, the chapter that Dr. Einstein and I wrote for the genital urinary cancers. It includes an electronic version, including an iPad ebook, original figures, including treatment flow charts, key points embedded within tumor boards and podcast links, and it's updated every six months. So here's one of the figures that's included in our chapter, and this is available on our iPad. So when I'm discussing a patient with, for example, either favorable or unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, I can pull this graphic out very easily right in the clinic setting and help the patient understand what the issues are and what the potential uh, nodal points are for treatment decisions. So it's an extraordinarily useful program uh, for practitioners, as well as for patients to understand what's going on with their particular disease category. And our particular chapter included a wide spectrum of new uh, diagrams that were created by Dr. Einstein. It also includes key points, and this is just sort of a, a version of that. Uh, and each of, the, each of the disease categories includes key points for practitioners. And also, uh, and also it's, uh, it's very, very understandable for uh, patients if they're so, so interested. So uh, my main topic today is going to be citations of greatest interest for practice change. And I'm sure during the course of this, uh, this convention, you'll hear great greater detail of many of the citations that I'm going to be giving. But this is really an overview of what we felt were practice changing capabilities for the ASCO community uh, that have just been recently published uh, in the update uh, to the uh, self-evaluation program. And the format of the slides is going to be what the topic is, what the citation or citations are, and what the key findings. So this is a distillation of a huge amount of information uh, that really takes home the take-home points of key articles over the past um, 12 to 18 months that really have impacted practice change within uh, urologic oncology and specifically uh, prostate cancer. So the first one is an imaging to increase the sensitivity of detection of micrometastatic or oligometastatic disease. The citations are shown here. And the findings are that PF PSMA with gallium 68 increased the ability to detect micrometastases either prior to radical prostatectomy or at the time of biochemical relapse. And the ability for PSMA gallium 68 to identify lesions is particularly important uh, for the next citation, which is our, our, what we term theranostics with lutetium 177 PSMA. So here are two key articles which have been published either in print or electronically, indicating that lutetium 177 PSMA in PSMA positive patients i.e. the patients had to have had a positive gallium 68 PSMA scan to participate in the study. And this, these studies showed improved survival versus either best supportive care from the New England Journal or improved PSA overall response rate when compared to uh, cabazitaxel. So I think you're going to be hearing much more about lutetium-177 uh, and it's really sort of complementary to the utility of the PSMA gallium 68 scan for patient selectivity. 
Emerging roles and trends of MRI following elevated PSA values. I know the European practices are somewhat different than that occurring in the United States, but these two citations indicate that uh, a, a patient undergoing for an elevation in the PSA with an MRI, who then undergoes an MRI-directed biopsy, increases clinically significant diagnosis of cancer, of prostate cancer, and less clinically insignificant cancers when compared to the utility of transrectal ultrasonography. MRI and systematic biopsies, the combination biopsy procedures, resulted in more prostate cancer detection, less pathological upstage, upstaging versus either modality alone. In our own institution for the initial evaluation, patients will undergo an MRI and a systematic biopsy and obviously with additional follow-up, we're essentially utilizing the MRI almost exclusively and not necessarily re uh, requiring uh, systematic biopsies uh, for, for example, patients on active surveillance who are being followed by uh, repeat biopsies and MRI. From a, a hormonal therapy perspective, uh, we have the introduction of the first oral GnRH antagonist, Relagolix, for the endocrine management of locally advanced biochemical relapsing or de novo metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. This is an article in the New England Journal by Dr. Shore. And again, this is a key article indicating that an oral GnRH antagonist, which up to this point had only been available as injectable in either the form of uh, Degorelix or Abrelix in the, in the, in the past, Relagolix orally achieved and maintained greater castration levels than parenteral LHRH agents. And there's an indication that they may, they may be associated with this particular agent, uh, less major uh, uh, adverse cardiovascular events. And so this is potentially very, very important and may change sort of some of the initial uh, hormonal management of patients with a variety of uh, advanced forms of prostate cancer. What about improvement of overall survival with the addition of androgen receptor antagonists? And this is an expanding field uh, here I show four key citations for your interest. And the key findings are that the Titan study, which was apalutamide, or the Enzymet study, which was enzalutamide, improved overall survival when added to ADT, including those with recurrent metastatic disease. Enzalutamide also improved progression-free survival in the Archer study, and both APA and Enza are FDA approved with an overall survival indication. So this is a you know a emerging story which is really changing the landscape of how we approach initial hormonal management of patients with a variety of forms of metastatic um, sens uh, castration sensitive disease. There have also been approval of three drugs for improving metastasis free survival and overall survival in non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And here are the key citations from European Urology and New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, really uh, key articles indicating that darolutamide in the Armas study and enzalutamide in the PROSPER study and enzalutamide in the Spartan study were associated with both improvement of metastasis-free survival and now confirmed improvement in overall survival. So these are clearly practice-changing activities uh, for the category of disease that we call non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So what Dr. Einstein and I have done is tried to provide a very capsular summary of all of these key articles for you to have in one place. PARP inhibitors are increasing their importance in metastatic CRPC. Here are two key articles, again, from Clinical Cancer Research in the New England Journal, that Olaparib in the profound study versus second line androgen uh, signaling inhibitors. Uh, and these were patients that had already had Abby of after ENZA or ENZA after Abby in homologous recombination or repair alterations improved both PFS and OS. Nucaparib in the Triton 2 study, which was a single arm study post ASIs and taxanes, had a 44% overall response rate in BRCA positive MCRPC. So again, PARP inhibitors are increasing their importance. Uh, and uh, you know these have a wide spectrum of differing sorts of uh, uh, toxicities and adverse events associated with them. But again, uh, they're becoming uh, mainstream in, in 
um, both HRRA positive and BRCA positive patients with prostate cancer. What about second line taxanes, uh, uh, post docetaxel uh, uh, and androgen signaling inhibitors? Again, this is a showing that in patients with progressing metastatic castration resistant PC after docetaxel and first line ASIs, cabazitaxel versus second line ASIs improved the overall survival. This study is a little bit suspect, uh, suspect in terms of its uh, design, mainly because the patients who had the second line ASI had relatively short uh, 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 responses and remissions, uh, potentially uh, using a selection bias for the improvement of cabazitaxel. But nonetheless, this again is, shows uh, definitely activity for cabazitaxel in those patients that have already had docetaxel as well as, an, uh, as well as a hormonal therapy. What about prostate cancer during COVID-19? So here I'm just summarizing some of the ASCO, EAU, and ASTRO guidelines that have been published during the, during the pandemic. And while we think the pandemic is over, there may be certain uh, pockets of, you know, pockets of uh, places uh, with, throughout Europe and the United States in which therapy and care for patients with prostate cancer may not be as seamless as it should be pre-pandemic. And one critical question is the androgen receptor control of Tempris 2 protease for COVID cellular entry important, which it is important in the prostate, whether or not this Tempris protease modulation is important uh, under, and whether it's under androgen receptor control in the lung is somewhat uncertain. But as you know, there've been a variety of uh, postulations, postulates to suggest that androgen deprivation may actually prevent the uh, infectivity of uh, COVID-19. Uh, for other aspects relating to the pandemic, for, uh, for those patients considering radical prostatectomy for intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer, if surgery is delayed as a result of the pandemic, one should consider neoadjuvant androgen ADT and consider neoadjuvant ADT with delayed radiation therapy. If radiation therapy can't be delayed during a pandemic, consider ultra-hypofractionation uh, and try to minimize fiducial rectal spaces in brachytherapy during the pandemic. And for metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer, one should consider ADT plus ABI, apalutamide, or enzer, uh, enzalutamide to avoid docetaxel, which may likely uh, result in more hospitalizations. So these considerations were really key during the peak of the pandemic. They may or may not be necessarily now, but again, it provides some sort of guideline if therapies need to be delayed, what kind of, uh, what kind of parameters uh, could be followed. And finally, um, within the ASCO SEP chapters, there's a global perspective in each of the chapters for each of the individual cancers. And this is a portion of uh, the GU chapter that was co-authored by uh, Dr. Cora Sternberg, and basically looking at the global landscape of genital urinary cancers. And what ASCO is trying to do is to really highlight and, high, and point out disparities in uh, mortality from all of the cancers. And this particular graph, which is, comes from the GU chapter, looks at the worldwide incidence of GU cancers, including prostate, bladder, kidney, testis, and penile, the number of the incidents, the number of deaths, and what they call as a mortality to incidence ratio or MIR ratio. And you can see that overall, the mortality, the MIR for prostate cancer is 0 0.28. If you take that number and divide it by the incidence number, that's how you come up with a 0.28. But the mortality uh, incidence ratio in high income countries is 0 0.19 compared to 0 0.42 in low to middle income countries. Again, indicating disparities um, uh, in the health system performance for cancer care. And again, it's a really sort of a very, very important and sobering evaluation to take a look at the differences in mortalities between uh, the countries based upon the uh, median, uh, median income aspects. So with that, I'll end this presentation and look forward to answering any questions. And I thank you very much for your, for your, uh, uh, for your uh, participation and uh, for your attention. Thank you very much.